I'm Alastair Cook, and today we're going to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the publication of The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. Eliot was born in 1888 and attended Harvard in 1906, intending to become a professor of philosophy. However, in 1910, he moved to France to study at the Sorbonne for his master's degree. He later studied in, Eng in Germany and then later in England where he remained for more or less the rest of his life. So in 1915, this is an important year for him, in 1915, T.S. Eliot decides he, A, isn't going back to America, B, isn't going to be a philosopher, but rather a poet, C, decides to marry. His first wife, Vivian Hay Wood, is, um, well, an interesting match for him, but the marriage does end in disaster. It is not until his second marriage to Valerie Elliott that he finally is happy in the final years of his life. Elliott won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1948, especially for his poetic work, which, of course, began in June of 1915 with the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Let us go then, you and I, while the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights and one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes. The yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and, seeing it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides upon the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you, and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair. With a bald spot in the middle of my hair, they will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounted firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a single pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life in coffee spoons. I know the voice is dying with a dying fall, beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase, 
And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight, downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl? And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say I have gone at dusk through narrow streets? I watched the, the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers. Stretched upon the floor here beside you and me, should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grow slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet. And here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker. And I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it after all? After the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worthwhile? After the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more? It is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern threw the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning towards the window would say, that is not it, it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No. <laughs> I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do, to swell a progress, start a scene or two. Advise the prince, no doubt, an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. I grow old. I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed in red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. The love song of J. Alfred Prufrock was one of Eliot's more important works. It launched the rest of his career. Ezra Pound edited the, the love song as well as many other of his poems, including The Wasteland most notably. 
Ezra Pound was also an un-American expat living in England um, and continued to live abroad for most of his life, just much as Elliot did. Elliot was a disillusioned person at certain points in his life. He was something of a hypochondriac. Although, to be fair, as a result of his lifelong habit of smoking, he did suffer from bouts of pneumonia, especially towards the end of his life. But he is probably best known not only as a poet, but also as a, as a champion of other poets as a um, editor for Faber and Faber during the 1930s. He would promote the work of various other European and American poets that came to him with their work, occasionally financially supporting them, but often either providing very astute advice or by, by in fact publishing them. By the time the 40s rolled around, he wasn't writing much poetry. His last great work was Four Quartets. By that point, even though his body of work was fairly small for a great poet, his, his poems were among the most renowned and recited of his and future generations. He is a totemic figure of modernism as a result. So that along with his love of cats and the love of the second wife, we shall leave him now. We shall leave him to the pages of history. A hundred years ago, his first book was published, and a hundred years later, we are still reading it, and we are still loving it. I'm Alastair Cook, and thank you for coming to Master Catalog Theater, where I hope you'll join me again when we read Roald Dahl's The Witches.